Hello and welcome to this uh, first look exploring session looking at the tragical history of Guy, Earl of Warwick. Yes, the tragical history, admirable achievements and various events of Guy, Earl of Warwick. A tragedy ve acted very frequently with great applause by His Late Majesty's Servants. Uh, which raises a whole series of interesting questions about when does this play come from? It is variously dated from the 1590s, 93, 94, or later in the 1620s. So it might be that this is a uh, remnants of an earlier play that gets revived or a play that is written later to look like an earlier kind of thing. I don't really know yet. I've I've done very little uh, hunting around on this particular one. I thought it was quite firmly from the 1590s until the other day when I was looking it up in various books and I just kept seeing question marks. So, um, so yeah. Um, and there's a whole series of question marks about what this play is trying to do and we're going to be finding out some of those exciting things as we start reading through it today. Today we're going to look at the first three acts and in the room reading various exciting and fun things will be reading King Athelstoon is... Sarah Blake. I'm an actor, writer and director living in Germany. Uh, reading Guy, Earl of Warwick is... Hello, Francis Cox, actor living in Amsterdam. Reading Time today is... Alan Scott, based in Suffolk. Reading Herod and Zarestes today is... Stephen Longstaff, based in northwest of England. Uh, reading Rohan and Sultan today is... Hi, I'm Eric, and I like to think that this is a sort of, I don't know, top five, like, royals mixed in kind of thing. I don't know, the, the, I, I haven't read the, the play, but it just looks like that kind of play where you've got all the heroes, um, you know, like, sort of crossovers. <laughs> yeah, I, there's a lot of names that are sounding awfully familiar, uh, and one of those is, uh, not only obviously, as we all remember from most plays, uh, Phyllis, but also <laughs> Oberon. <laughs> Hello, my name is Lynn. I'm a college composition teacher. I live in the northwestern United States. Uh, reading Old Philip Sparrow today and Enchanter is... Hello, I'm Helen Good uh, and I used to be a historian. Nowadays I'm not so sure. Uh, reading uh, The Clown uh, Sparrow is... Bryony Sparrow, and apparently I would have been called Philip Sparrow had I been a boy, so I'm glad I wasn't. Um, but yeah, I'm actor and sometime octopus in the East Midlands. Uh, reading Parnell and the King of Jerusalem is... Rachel Nicole, actor in New Jersey. It's excited to read the dude of... Uh, dude Earl of Warwick. Uh, reading uh, Hermit and a Spirit today is... Aliki Chapel, actor, translator and theatre maker, also in Northwest England. And I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I will be reading uh, the occasional stage direction and generally moving us along. And on that note, we will dive into the text. Act one, uh, what I'm calling scene one. I don't know precisely how this is actually supposed to be split up, but we have the appearance of Enter... Time. Time that is past, the muses now recalls, forcing my fleeting presence to retire and pitch my feet upon the English shore. I had almost drowned in black oblivion, an honoured history of an English knight, as famous once for deeds of chivalry as any of the worthies of the world. Renowned Sir Guy of Warwick, whose great name makes England famous in all after times for nursing up so brave a martialist. Time now renews his fortunes to the world and lays them open to your gentle views. Think then, with apprehensive eyes you see this war like Lord boldly attempt to fight with that fell savage boar of Caledon that spoils the fields and murders passengers. <coughs> Him hath his sword subdued and now again, he combats with that huge and monstrous beast <coughs> called the wild cow of Dunmore, Dunsmore Heath. All for the love of Phyllis he performs. For Phyllis' love, old Rohan's only child, 
what will not guy of warwick dare to do and having done those things that she enjoined he reaps the harvest of our happy love and at the length enjoys her for his wife to grace this bridal feast imagine then king athelstan hath left fair winchester and here in warwick castle keeps his court what follows now of guy and his fair deeds sit and behold the story now proceeds and exit time we're going to dive into the first scene we'll get a, a further sense of the play i think we're already starting to gather some interesting uh, thoughts uh, act one scene two as i have it labeled enter king athelstan guy phyllis rohan herod with others brave guy of warwick honorable oh Thus long in love and favour to thyself, King Athelstan hath left fair Winchester to frolic here with thee, and thy fair bride, Phyllis, the comfort of old Rowan's age. Thus long to you we have been troublesome, and used your parks and pastures as our own. <laughs> but now we'll leave these parts of Warwickshire, and back again return to Winchester. These kingly favours that your grace, grace has to show, in honouring me, a worthless subject thus, hath plumed my thoughts with eagle, fly, eagle flighted wings, and bears my mouth in mind as high as heaven, till I have done some deeds of chivalry, worthy the love of your dread majesty, which I'll perform with treble di diligence. Um, and, at, and at your yearly feast of Pentecost will Guy of Warwick send a hundred knights subdued and conquered by these warlike arms to do their homage to, to King Athelstone, lowly upon their knees at Winchester. We thank thee, Guy, but we'll not have it so. Live with thy love. Thy sword hath won thee fame, and all the world doth speak of Warwick's name. The conquest that by thee hath been achieved makes men amazed, and warlike knights afraid to come in danger of thy conquering sword. Oh, I have a spare lord. Someone <clears throat> wants to jump in. Uh, Aliki, be a lord. Thy manly deeds are graven in each man's breast, and thy large fame is spread from east to west. Live then in peace, my fair-hearted son. Since all men muse to think what thou hast done, the Caledonian savage boar is dead, and by thy hand the wild cow slaughtered, that kept such rebels upon uh, Dunsmore Heath, and many adventures thou hast passed beside to make my daughter Phyllis thy bride. She now is thine, and all that I possess is Guy of Warwick, so he'll stay with us. Intends my honored lord to leave us then, Speak, gentle love, my heart is full of fear. Oh, seek not danger that is everywhere. Content thee, Phyllis, for he shall not go. Thy love entreats, but we command him so. And now, Earl Rohan, reach the king thy hand. Old man, we thank thee, and we take our leave. Farewell, Sir Guy. Fair Phyllis, now adieu. All earthly comfort still attend on you. And exit King Athelstan. Bright angels, still protect your majesty. Father, conduct the king a little on his way. Sir Herod, attend them. Phyllis, here. And I must confer. We'll follow presently. And exit Rohan and Herod. What means my honoured lord to stay behind when everyone attends his sovereign? What dost thou look so sad and stand so mute? all looking downwards with thy care-crazed head. To speak, gentle love, if grief thy mind oppress, Phyllis will never leave thee comfortless. Ah, oh, Phyllis. Sweet, what hast Phyllis done that thy great heart should grieve to think upon? Nothing, oh, nothing. And I now to thee, neither the fear of death, the loss of friends, nor anything this mortal life can yield, doth trouble me or once molest my mind. What then disturbs thy high heroic thoughts? That I must leave my Phyllis whom I love. Oh, be not sad, dear soul, but hear me speak, for what I say must stand irrevocable. 
Seven years to win thy love, this sword of mine, hath beat down on monsters and subdued strong knights. Seven years to win thy love, this breast of mine, hath been opposed even against the face of death. But for my God, who gave me power and strength to do these wonders in the sight of man, hath Guy of Warwick yet no service done the thought of which torments my inward soul and breaks my heart until i my and breaks my heart until i have redeemed my great neglect of service to my god for which to him alone i have made a vow never to lie by my fair phyllis side to eat to drink nor rest long in one place till i have seen my savior's sepulchre within the walls of fair jerusalem and with my sword, for my Redeemer's sake, beat back those misbelieving Saracens that seek the ruin of that holy place, making them leave deluding Muhammad and trust upon the blessed name of Christ. All this hath Warwick sworn to undertake or lose his life for his Redeemer's sake. Sweet Lord. Oh, do not bid me stay and ask what thou wilt, I must away. See the rich burden of my youthful womb, the hopeful issue of thy happy love. Let that yet move thee. Dear Lord, do not go, lest both of us do pine with grief and woe. Weep not, sweet love, for tears will not avail. But when the time comes, thou art brought on bed, and of thy child art self -del safe delivered, give it to Herod, if, he, if it be a son. With it, with it deliver him this, this ring of gold. Tell him that I entreat him from my heart, that he will see my infant well brought up. Bid him be kind to him, as I have been, in all adventures dangerous to him. Now give me my palmer's gown, my hat and staff, for I must wear, fly hence, all worldly pomp. Thus, for my saviour and redeemer's sake, these blessed weeds of pilgrimage I take. My heart so sad, I know not what to say. God grant thy grave be not that gown of gray. My much misdoubting heart says I shall see my high loved Lord laid low in misery. Do not presage, dear love, but hear me speak. I charge thee on that love thou bearest me, never to reveal to father, friend, no, no nor the king himself, that what I intend, nor whither I am gone, until a month be past, and I hence free, for pursuit of my friends will follow me. Do this, and Phyllis' love will brightly shine, and Guy return with joy from Palestine. I must, I will, even do what you please. Your will shall be fulfilled, yet ere you go. This pledge of my true love I will bestow. Upon thy hand I put my marriage ring, if e'er I see the same, and thou not by, Phyllis will grieving weep, and weeping die. I take thy pledge of love, and in exchange, I give this true love's kiss, and here I vow, nothing but death shall make me leave this ring. Time calls me hence, fair Phyllis, now farewell. With, with thee let all heaven, heaven's joys forever dwell. And they exit. Okay, um, this has given us quite a lot to talk about. Um, where to begin? Uh, I think we need to start with the, the that that monstrous beast called the wild cow of Dunsmore Heath. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know. Um, yeah, this is this is this is quite fun so far. I'm 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 uh, putting that in the general romp area. I I do note a problem potentially in the future when we come to uh, questions of going out and and uh, taking down misbelieving Saracens. There could be some problematic material coming ahead. Um, but l let's see. For all we, it's it's fundamentally a different question as to whether a character from the time is uh, taking that viewpoint. Whether the play continues on that trend, we shall see. Um, yeah, we've got. We've got Phyllis, we've got the wild cow, uh, the boar of Caledon. Um, yeah, we've got time 
laying out the plot not quite quite neatly um i'm having fun um th th thoughts from the room because <laughs> before we even started i was saying i'm not quite sure what this play is and i'm i think i still don't really know what this play is uh lynn i'll go to you first then eric then aliki in a lot of ways though we know where we are we have a manly manly chivalric hero you know he's quite he's He's being idealized already that he's been very, very brave and um, fighting for his true love's, uh, fighting for his true love's hand and has done that successfully. It took him seven years. Uh, and now uh, he's proven that he's very brave and heroic. He's also very pious and he's gonna go fight for Christendom in, in the Holy Land, but he's gonna do it secretly. Uh, so, um, we kind of know who he is and where we are in this sort of idealized chivalric past. And we've got, I'm going to do something but not tell anyone. We know that's going to lead to complications. And there's an exchange of rings, which is also quite conventional that something, you know, something untoward happens there. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of signals of like where we are and where we're going, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, Eric. I was going to say that it's interesting. The, the feats that are discussed are like the Caledonian boar and the wild cow of <laughs> Dunsmore Heath, um, which seem sort of, well, like Stephen put in the chat um, something about the nine worthies and so on and so forth, um, which uh, um, seems a bit like it's, a, I don't know, again, like a sort of crossover between, you know, mythical, uh, but like sort of ancient classical Greek myth or ancient Greek Roman myth. Um, and Christianity. So I, I'm curious to see where this is going to go. Yeah, I mean, yeah, let's let's be practical. A wild cow coming at you at pace is quite scary. It is really the 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 problem is the word wild cow uh, doesn't quite land. Uh, if it was a bull uh, or or a, a different uh, signifier that we want to use, so I'm wondering whether this is deliberately being semi comic or or not, and it's uh, whether that's just us. I, I don't know how the how these words are being used then. Um, and how what what tone this play is actually taking, or whether it's uh, it's uh, it's not uh, not as amusing as perhaps we're finding it. Uh, a leaky, then Helen, then Francis, then Sarah. <laughs> so yeah, I was going to say that thing about the cow. If we think of it as you know angry cattle, and especially at the kind of angry cattle you'd have had in the Middle Ages, which would probably look more like a Highland coo than what we think of now as a cow. Uh, it was probably a pretty scary critter. Uh, as for the Caledonian boar, I love that I can't tell whether it's meant to be in Caledonia, Scotland, or whether it's meant to be the boar of Caledon that Hercules slaughtered, and how fabulous is that? Also, poor Phyllis. Hi, dear. Have a quickie. Off on crusade. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it, but it, you know, it's it's it. They get a, a proper dialogue with each other. It's not some sort of weird public performancey kind of thing. So there, the, there, there is that. Um, he said, clutching at straws. Helen, then Francis. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they seem to also be confusing Athelstan, who was a real guy and was the grandson of Alfred the Great, and King Arthur, who had all these chivalric knights questing a lot um which which baffled me at first but what really baffled me is this guy herod i mean i had assumed it was some biblical herod but who sir herod is we don't know but he appears to be godfather to guy's unborn son yeah, because the, the, there's nothing ominous about handing a child to someone called Herod. Um, well, right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, Francis, then Sarah, then Alan. Yeah, I was struck by this line of times right at the beginning in the prologue when he says, uh, it's a guy of Warwick whose great name makes England famous in all after times. Because I've never even heard of this guy. Or is that just my ignorance? <laughs> Uh, well, no, I, 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 it's, it's not one that I immediately conjure with. And there are no. questions that we should be asking in later sessions about, you know, who this guy 
is and 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 what this you know what the what his reputation is and uh, and and how that all go fits together uh, but for the moment i'm i'm delighted by our ignorance and that is fine uh sarah then alan i just um yeah it was just when you were talking about you know this business with the cow is it is it is it serious or is it actually funny it's not just the fact that it's a wild cow it's the fact that it's a cow that kept up, kept up such revels upon Dunsmore Heath. I, you know, I want to see a cow reveling on Dunsmore Heath. I don't even know where Dunsmore Heath is, but I've got this image now of this cow keeping revels. So I can't believe that that's not. Ah, it's impossible to tell, really. But I can't believe that there isn't isn't some humour implied. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be said. Oh, I do feel like we need the we need the part one, don't we? We really want to see what how this what happened with this cow. I'm fascinated by this cow now, and and the whole backstory. You know, is is does the cow have a sort of uh, you know day glow uh, clothing and a whistle and is just reveling it, or you know a, a what kind dance. of reveling? Yeah, what what, what music is is this cow reveling to? Um, I mean, we're, be I mean, we're being fast that... and loose with the meaning of reveling, but uh, anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> having having said that, I did used to uh, tour guide at a castle where the 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 guy's ancestor he'd first been knighted by Edward the Third because he saved Edward the Third from a wild wild boar that was on the point of killing the king, and and this guy like leapt into the middle of it and and stuck it and, and saved the king and was knighted on the spot and, you know, changed the course of history, possibly, in the process. So, I mean, maybe it is completely serious. I don't know. But I just, that line made me laugh so much. <laughs> uh, Alan, and then we'll move on. Yeah, I, I have a feeling that this play may originate actually in the commentary area. Um Guy of Warwick obviously has got a local connection, and I've just Googled, and Dunsmore Heath is actually close to Rugby, so not that many miles away from that area. So I'm just wondering whether there is a specific locus where this place sort of originates from. Hmm. Okay, so lots of thoughts in the room. Uh, let's gather more evidence as we go to Act 1. I'm calling it Scene 3. Enter old Philip Sparrow and his son, the clown. What's that, me son? Never talk, father, never talk. For youth will have his swinge, if it be in a halter, and I, being a young man and a scholar, will go travel to try the fruits of my learning. But whither wilt thou go soon, ah? Faith, father, Romo Romulus, even to Rome, mortar mortaribus with a mortar on my head. But, father, I'll come upon ye with a verse. Priapia qui maribonis tribunter mascule dogstones. What's that, son? That is, you must give me forty pounds, and I must go seek my fortune. Nay, shall the forty of my teeth on that. Thor, son, knave, free tarry at home, he might be clerk of our parish, so he might. He has his writing and reading tongue as perfect as eating porridge, so he has. And besides all that, he spouts Latin as vast as a Miss Grill's fault. But ye know the cause why thou'dst be vain, be jogging. Why, father? Nay. Shall I tell thee with a witness? Tis comported all about our parish that thou hast got our neighbour Sparling's daughter with a bairn. How comes the old fox to know this trow? Well, I must set a good face on the matter or all's marred. Who I get her with child? Father, why I take to witness the backside of our barn door, I never kissed her but twice in all my life. That thou shalt see. Come with up, Parnell. And enter Parnell. Oh, Mr. Sparrow, I thought you would have used me thus. Why, Parnell, how have I used you? If there be ever a one in the parish can use you better, let him take you and the child too for me. But, Mr. Sparrow, you are not so good as your promise. Nay, Parnell, never talk of that, for I have been better to you than my promise. How, knave? 
Hast thou been better to her than thy promise, ah? Why, father, if you'll not buy off my nose, I'll tell thee. I'll tell ye. I promise her to go home and eat a sour milk posset. And if I have got her with child, tis more than my promise, and she's beholden to me for my labour. Aye, sirrah, but you mun marry her and make amends. How like an old fool you talk, father. Why, she had more need make me amends, for I have made her look pretty and plump, and she has made me look like a shot and herring. But, father, take your blessings from me, for I must needs be walking. Honey sops Queen Marie's pence, tears part at going hence. Ego volo domine tu, a sparrow will come with joy to you. God's malediction go with thee, good son. Ah, oh, wish me, wish me. Farewell, good Mr. Sparrow. And exuant old man and Parnell. Nay, do not cry, good father, do not weep, sweet Parnell, but even farewell and be hanged, that's twice, God boy. I made as though I have been sorry, but I could not weep, and if I should have been hanged, but blah, but now will I go serve the bravest men in all the world. His name's Sir Guy of Warwick. They say he's going to Jerusalem and Jericho, but if he goes to the devil, I'll go with him. That's flat. And if Parnell be brought to bed before I come again, some honest fellow do so much as pay for the nursing of the child, and I'll do as much for him another time. And exit clown. And yeah, this tearful farewell where the clown is intimated the clown is doing some extravagant crying, perhaps, there, which is a sort of bit of comic business that clowns have been known to do. There's lots of good stuff in here. Um, I'm particularly liking uh, the clown's use of Latin. Um, or bits of it. Uh... <laughs> yeah, well, it's not that sort of Latin. Yeah. Uh, Dogstone Latin. Um, so... <laughs> and we could call it Cod Latin with all this shot and herring about. Yeah. The, the use of asides, there are there are various lines that we can mark as asides, uh, you know, where, you know, the, both father and son basically turn to the audience and go, hang on. Um, so the, there's, a, there's a little bit of the old clown, the old, uh, older uh, uh, sparrow there, actually, as well. Um, just hints of it. And yeah, so um, I like this idea. I must go seek my fortune. Please, please give me lots of money so that I can get my fortune. <laughs> I like this clown logic. I like this clown logic. Any th brief thoughts? Because I'm sure we will encounter Sparrow again uh, very soon uh, with, with as the A and B plot meet. Uh, El Leaky. Just that this is, to some extent, a comic parallel of the parting scene between Guy and Phyllis in that he's leaving a woman pregnant behind him. Mm, yes, nice. Yes, well, not nice, but obviously, um, but you know, um, it's an interest. Yes, it and yeah. So this this play is, is doing slightly interesting business about uh, this this supposedly terribly romantic, uh, idealized uh, initial scene, and then uh, and then this scene, which is doing very different business with it. Bryony, um, just that Sparrow seems like a nice, honest chap. I'm sure that Latin definitely meant what he said it meant, and. Um, but just a nice parting shot at the end about hoping that somebody else comes and takes his lady to bed so that they can be slammed for the child maintenance, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> yes, on, honest, 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 uh, honest uh, uh, citizen there. Eric? Uh, I was just going to say that it's sort of... Um, I, I no, it wasn't necessarily about the text. I just really enjoyed Bryony's accent plus the Latin. It was just like <laughs> continuing that into the Latin was just genius. Yes, um, that was me. Uh, okay, uh, there's lots of uh, really nice stuff in there that we uh, may unpack in more detail in the future. But otherwise, we're going to go on. Uh, we're going to run the next couple of scenes. Uh, we're into what's labelled as Act Two. I'm going to run them into each other. Uh, so. You thought you could get rid... No, time. Time will always follow you. You cannot escape from time. Uh, Act 2, scene 1, enter time. Devotion and divine achievements cause Great Guy of Warwick to neglect all laws Of nuptial leave. He leaves his pregnant wife, Country and kindred for a holy life, But in his progress makes himself a prize 
to multitudes of matchless miseries, by which it may be justly understood, he is not truly great that is not good. In holy lands abroad his spirits roam, and not in deans and chapter lands at home. His sacred fury menaceth that nation, which hath in dear under Judea under sequestration. He doth not strike at surpluses and tippets to bring an oleo in, of sets of sippets, but deals his warlike and death doing blows against his saviors and his sovereign's foes. What that coat of armor fears no change of weather, where sanctity and soldier go together. So doth our champion march up to the fight. Sit silent and pray. Time will bring all to light. And exit <clears throat> time. Act two, scene two. Enter Guy, and already they've met. Enter Sparrow. What, sir, our Sparrow? Anon, sir, anon. What? Are you turned to tap first since you came out of England? Tap, sir, quoth, or I shall never be so good a man while I live, for I had rather see a tapster than a king. I like your long journey at sea well, but for one thing. What's that, I pray? Oh, master, here's no alehouses, by the way. A man can get a can of beer for any money. A man cannot get a can of beer for any money. But, master, why did you give that great castle you got from the giant to that puling harlotry, harlotry in the silk gown? Why, sir, she was a lady of great birth. A ladle of great birch? Why, she had been a ladle of holly. I would not have given to her, I trow. You had been better a given it me by half. What wouldst thou have done with it? I would have wrapped it in her letter and sent it to Warwickshire for a token. But master, good sweet master, lend me your sword. And enter a hermit while this exchange is going on. What wilt thou do with it? Here comes an old man. I'll kill him. Ye cowardly rogue. Wilt thou kill a hermit? An emmet quotha. Tis one of the foulest great emmets that, that ever I saw. God bless thee, Father, and send thee happiness on earth and heaven when thou diest. And the gallows, when I dies, what should he do with heaven? Oh, what art thou that speakest of God or heaven? For forty winters have I lived here and never heard the name of God till now, but in my prayers and my orisons. A saucy old knave, I perceive. He used to eat oranges, which very word makes me have an appetite as fierce as a fiddler at a feast. It is a question of some difficulty to resolve whether my master's spirit or my stomach be the greater. If he have the valour to knock down a dun cow, I have the courage to cut her up and the confidence to carbonado her quarters. Father, unto your private ears I dare. Power out my spirit, my designments are for holy actions. You may understand, you may understand. My pilgrimage is to the Holy Land, where my Redeemer's cause is trodden down, where he wore thorns, usurpers wear a crown. I go to view the monument and story of him that was no less than Lord of Glory. You answer punctually to what I ask, but son, you undertake a tedious task as, as intricate as dangerous. May I crave the name of him whose valour is so brave. Although I now, I now shrouded in these pilgrims' weeds and holy habit fit for holy deeds, I am an earl. Men call me Guy of Warwick. In all the space betwixt Stover and Burwick, I have not known a man of clearer fame whose actions add new glory to his name than he that owns that title. All that's good attend your spirit and preserve your blood. And Father Emmett, did you never hear of the famous actions and valorous achievements of one Squire Sparrow? Away, you hedge bird. Philip is his name, a bird of Venus and a cock of the game, who once, being in love with pretty Parnell, did crack her nut, and thou mayest pick the colonel. She is a peacock, every man doth veil, is bonnet to her when she shoes her tail. 
Leave talking of your trundle, sirrah. Why so? Mistress Parnell is as precious to me as your lady Phyllis is to you. We have gotten them both with child, and all the difference is that Phyllis is your wedded wife, and Parnell is my unmarried mistress, and we needs must run up and down killing dun cows, dragons, wild boars, and mastiff dogs, when we have more work at home than we can well turn our hands to. I like your high design. That for the truth can in the days of dalliance and youth prosecute piety and attempt things that consecrate the crowns of greatest kings. Father, your benediction will add wings to all my undertakings. And Guy kneeleth. May the springs of ever pregnant providence ne'er be shot to your wants but flow fertile and free. May you ne'er feel necessity's sharp rod. The blessed guardians of the highest God protect my steps and keep thee far from ill. So farewell, son, my prayers attend thee still. Nay, but do you hear, old man? Pray, let you and I have a two or three cold words together. Have you ever a house here in these woods? No house but a poor cottage, gentle friend. Unch, how say ye? You would fain curry favour with me, but twill not serve your turn. Have ye ever an ambry in your cottage where a man may find a good bag pudding and piece of beef, or a platter of bruised knuckle deep in fat? For I tell the old fellow I am sharp set, and I have not eat a good meal this fortnight. Come hither, sirrah. Can I no sooner come into a stranger's company, but you seek to disgrace me? Who, I? Why, master, you are mightily deceived in me, for I never used to say grace before I see me on the table. Sirrah, I speak not of saying grace, but of disgrace. Therefore, Sirrah, go and tell him you want no meat. Shall I tell him so? Aye, sir. I shall tell him a monstrous lie, then. You'll tell him so, quickly too, if I entreat you. Yes, I'll tell him, because I dare do other do no otherwise. Old man, did I tell you I wanted meat? Hi, Mary, did you? Ye lie like an old knave. Yet, if you have any bread and cheese about you, put a piece in my cap. Sir, leave your freighting. Father, fare you well. More good attend thee than my tongue can tell. And exit the hermit. <laughs> this is the stately tower of Donatha where Huon of Bordeaux, a courageous knight, slew Angelofar in a single fight. Go, Sparrow, seek, find me an entrance in, and let me alone to cope with, the, with those comes forth. Why, master, have you no more wit but to send me? Did you not hear that there keeps a monstrous giant in this castle, that eateth a quarter of an ox at a bit? His mouth's as wide as a barn door, his eyes as broad as two pewter platters, and besides all that, they say, he hath four and twenty men to throw mustard in his mouth. Now, if I should come in the way, fall in the mustard pot, and be thrown into his mouth, you might go look for a man where you could get him. I but you being a sparrow, methinks should fly from them. Oh, master, I must confess I have been something loftily minded in my young days, but Parnell and the rest of the pretty wenches in our parish have so plucked my plumes that I was never a good mounter since, if faith. It thunders and lightning. Very well. Then you'll not go? Go. Yes, I'll go. That's flat. Oh, master, the devil, the devil, the devil. Why? How now, sirrah? Are you afraid? No, I scorn to be afraid, but good master, for God's sake, grant me one request upon my knees, I ask it. What's that, sir? Sweet honey, master, go yourself. I thank you, sir, but if you go not soon, my sword shall bring you of a stomach to go. Oh, master, never talk of that, for I have a stomach like a horse, but no heart in the world to go to such a breakfast. But yet I'll go what summer, what summer comes on. Though I run into a bush presently, I am in, master. I am in. It is no giant shore that keeps this place, but some enchanter or damned sorcerer 
Hellhound, come forth, that I may cope with thee. I fear not all thy charming sorceries. Send forth no shadows to affright my soul. My faith no hellborn fury can control. Enter the enchanter. Let all my horrid vapours cease their strength. Let the air freeze, the earth be cold as ice, whereon this daring knight doth set his feet. For though hell's force can no way daunt his heart, he soon shall know my force can tame his pride. I cannot lift my arms unto my head. My feet stick fast into the solid earth, and I shall never move myself from hence. Damned enchanter, hellish sorcerer, whose black damned art hath wrought my luckless fall. Oh, that thou durst let loose this damned spell. I soon would send thy fiend-like soul to hell. By all the burning brooks of Phlegiton, by Styx and Acheron, I vow and swear ne'er shalt thou go alive out of this place. Thus do I lay a charm upon thy head, a hell-bred slumber close thy senses up. There, Groveling lie, and never more arise. A black enchanted charm, close up thine eyes. And Guy falls and exits the enchanter. And the next stage direction, which we're not going to read on for a, for a few moments, is Enter Oberon, <laughs> King of the Fairies. So, um... Yeah, thunder and lightning. There's there's bits of material that seems awfully familiar here. This uh the whole uh gag about um uh the uh the uh killing a hermit, killing an emmet, killing a killing an ant uh gag. We've had that before. Uh, I think we've had that before maybe more than once. It feel it's feeling like a specific clown's bit of shtick. And though the accent's different, it's feeling very hodgy, mm. isn't it? Uh, I'm looking at Sarah for this moment. Uh, just the, the this master servant relationship that Guy and Sparrow have instantly got. I mean, you know, time has said time has passed. They've met up, uh, but they've instantly got this stick going on that works so well. I'll go to Sarah first. Yeah, they have, and it reminded me a lot of Hodge as well. And the other thing that reminded me of Hodge is actually his speech rhythms. His is Sparrow's speech patterns. Um, especially those those chunkier speeches he had, that reminded me an awful lot of Hodge and that, that big speech that he has um, when he first uh, hooks up with um, Thomas Cromwell on in uh, in Italy. It, it just, and I don't know, I don't know if it's the same playwright or the same clown, but, but really, really reminiscent. Hmm. Uh, we are massively projecting perhaps here, but uh, I just couldn't resist bringing up, say, Thomas Cromwell, uh, which is a, a, a play with lots of really fun fun uh, comic material in it, as well as, as very sad sadness too. Um, but yeah, we've got so much good comedy stuff going on. I just love the bit when, you know, please, Master, before you send me to my certain doom, can I just request one thing? What's that? Go yourself. <laughs> 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 that's just absolutely brilliant i just love that and then he appears to dive into a bush or something we have no stage direction but that was noted uh Bryony, i think uh, put that in the chat the, the the yeah we've got thunder and lightning go and kill a giant uh let's do some more wonderful wonderful stuff and then an enchanter appears and they hurl insults at each other <laughs> I mean, we've seen things like this uh, in, in various places, um, you know, obviously Old Wife's Tale uh, and and uh, a, a bit in Climate and Climides as well. Uh, I don't know how much magic was in that. Obviously, we've got Oberon turns up in James the Fourth. So, um, yeah, I'm getting so many different things coming out from so many different directions. Uh, any thoughts in the room? We still haven't finished the scene, obviously. Lots of thoughts. I go to Lynn, then I go to Rachel, then I go to Eric. I'm going to completely change the subject because I am 
struck by the in in times uh, monologue i'm struck by the use of the word pregnant i have never seen the word pregnant used to mean what we use it to mean in an early modern text it, women are always described as being with child pregnant means something else and then later in the next scene pregnant means what i it it, it often means in early modern like important or full of matter or so it, like the scholars in the room it, have you seen the word pregnant meaning to be expecting to give birth uh, in the 1590s? I, I, I'm not, I wasn't as surprised by it as you are, but thinking about it, no, it isn't the common usage. Yeah, I've never seen it used to mean oh. uh, pregnant. OED time. Yeah, mm. yeah. Everyone starts. Everyone starts looking into search engines. Uh, yeah, uh, Rachel. Uh, no, I was just gonna say, like the the those time speeches, the like how they're a chorus. It just reminds me of um, those star, in Star Wars, the the wall, the like scrolling wall of text that they have at the beginning of the thing that just tell you what happened while you weren't watching, and then they're like, "All right, let's throw you into." all these lasers shooting <laughs> yeah love yes uh that that uh, was um was uh, who was next was it eric um uh, yeah, was imagine eric. that and then francis yeah. um i i was just going to say that uh, when this started i thought okay so like you know, like when we got to the first scene that kind of thing um but before um the second act I, th I was like, okay, so is this like sort of Arden of Faversham kind of comedy, like sort of useless murderous kind of thing? But because it, it's labeled as a tragedy. And then um, it just kind of in the second act decided to do <laughs> some sort of strange dance and just has gone into, I don't know, Endymion and like Musidorus and loads of other play territory, which is just completely like fantasy territory. Uh, Francis. Yeah, I was struck by uh, that um, uh, thing Far Sparrow said about um, Guy conquering a castle from a giant and giving it to a harlot. Um, <laughs> and and then they seem to come across another castle with another giant. So it seems like um, Guy is just sort of going around the world uh, doing all these chivalrous things. Yeah, or, or he's got a, you know, he's got a very clear USP. You know, he goes into an area. Is there a giant I can fight? Yes, yeah. that's that's gonna, you know, I'm I'm quite good at them. Um, yeah. Smaller things, less so good. Yeah, in uh, uh, I think Stephen uh, uh, mentioned this in the chat. Uh, Musidorus, uh, we have Musidorus's line: "I am an hermit, an emmet. I never saw such a big emmet in all my life before." So it's it's pretty much exactly the same gag. Um, so yes, uh, Briny. I'm just really enjoying the, the total mixes of uh, mythologies that are being thrown out here. Like the, it's, it's a bit of a who's who. There's a hell of a lot of name dropping, which we do. We get a lot of that in plays. But I like the, the giant connection because that brings it back to this country's mythology. Because, um, you know, the, all the, the Welsh mythology is completely so many giants going on. And just, yeah, I like that. Yes, lovely. OK, we're still mid-scene. Um, but Rachel, very briefly. Um... Uh, no, about that, you know, the silliness of this. Um, I don't know. It reminds me in some, there, there's something about this that reminds me of like Lord Mayor's shows, like all these different things coming together. And then uh, St how Stephen the other day in um, the, this is 1583, was talking about the different like places for theater. And I, I, I don't, I wonder if this is like, I don't know, something celebratory or done in the country. Mm. Uh, and that's a reference to a, th uh, a podcast that will be coming out sometime in the next uh, month or two. Uh, so that you heard it here first. Um, uh, but yes, uh, and, and yeah, Lord Mayor Show is very keen on, um, uh, on giants and big things because uh, they make really good, uh, big, big, big props. So um, yeah, 
Uh, loving that. Okay, we need to move on because we've been keeping the king of the fairies waiting, people. <laughs> um, what are we like? Uh, enter Oberon. Uh, so Guy's fallen. The enchanters exited. Um, uh, sparrows in a bush. And uh, enter Oberon, king of the fairies. But I will break thy charming sorceries and he shall wake to be thy overthrow. You, Harmless spirits of the flowery meads, nymphs, satyrs, fawns, and all the fairy twain that waits on Oberon, the fairy king, attend me quickly with your silver tune. And in a circling ring, let's compass round this sleeping night that lies upon the ground. Enter the fairies with music. Uh, they dance about him. And Oberon strikes Guy with his wand. And he awakes and speaks. Where art thou, Guy? What heavenly place is this? What ravishing sound of music fills mine ear? What blessed shadows do appear to me that I'm a woeful, wretched, sinful man? Oh, pardon me, as I am faithful true. I never yet meant hurt to none of you. We know it well. Arise, fair knight, stand up. Guy ariseth. Thou wert enchanted by a hellish fiend that doth inhabit in this hateful tower. He cast thee in a deadly charming sleep, and but by my means thou shouldst never have walked, or waked, probably. I am the fairy king that keeps these groves for Huon of Bordeaux, for Huon of Bordeaux's sake, thy warlike friend the dear loved minion of the fairy king. Will I make Guy Vork's name be feared? Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. Um, for conquest of the Tower of Donathur, here take this charming wand. I give it thee, which is of great virtue it, it, it touch. All the enchantments in this spacious world, they all shall be dissolved immediately. For proof whereof, make trial against this tower. And in a moment it shall vanish hence. Great fairy king, how I am bound to thee that from these dangers hast delivered me. I'll touch this tower if that dissolve these charms. Warwick is free from all enchanting harms. It thunders and lightens. Enter Sparrow running. Fire! 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 How now, Sirrah? What's the news with you? Whoop, master, are you still alive? Nay, then, I care not, if faith, but I have been peppered since I went from you. How, sir, I pray? When you sent me to seek an entrance into the castle, I, thinking it was good sleeping in a whole skin, ran and hid myself in a bush. I had not lain there long, but it began to thunder and lighten monstrously, and presently the bush flew a fire about my ears, that with your favour I came away in a stinking complexity. But master, what fine little harp, oh, my thumbs, have you got here? Sirrah, take heed what you say, for these are fairies. Fairies, quotha, I care not what they be. I'll have a bout, I'll have a bout with them for a bloody nose. I'll have a better stomach to fight with one of them than with the giant a, a great deal. Unchy horse and little pig pies, you I'll tickle your faith. The fairies fall about him, pulls him down, pinches him, and he cries out. Oh, oh master, help, help. <laughs> How now, sirrah? What's the news with you? I am killed, master. I am killed. Killed, knave? Where art killed? In the buttock, in the buttock. Well, sir, rise, or I'll rise ye. Rise, quotha, yes, I'll rise, but I am sure I am dead. Do you call these fairies a vengeance on them? They have tickled my colophodiums, i' faith. But, master, what is that same little gentleman's name? Sir, his name is King Oberon. Little gentleman, is your name King Colbron? No, sir, my name is King Oberon. Why then, good King Muttonbone, learn your little munchkeys to pair, the, to pair their nails with a pestilence, for my posteriors will feel the print of them this fortnight at the least. Sir, hold your peace. And, Guy, give me thy hand, 
the way I'll show thee to the Holy Land, where I will add such glory to thy name that all the world shall speak of Warwick's fame. The black enchanter, he is gone to hell in endless torments ever for to dwell. Nymphs, satyrs, fawns, and all the rest march on before stout Guy and youthful Oberon. And they exit well. Um, much, much delight and merriment to be had there. Um, it does seem that the fairies, uh, Oberon as well, are all quite young. Um, uh, that they, they uh, uh, and they like pinching bottoms. <laughs> um, it does seem to be the posterior is the thing that's getting pinched here. Um, so yes, uh, Sparrow's dialogue continues to to be delightful. I came away in a stinking complexity. Um, I think that's one for you later use, isn't it? Uh, oh yeah, this is uh, this is a good. Um, I don't know who came uh, was was um, asking questions about uh, Oberon's. Um, uh, a wand that uh, was handing over there. Um, keep it clean, please. Uh, so, um, <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, uh, thought any thoughts from the rumors that completion of act through act two, act two is now complete. Um, it's Lynn, <laughs> this just feels like a really weird mashup of, of, uh, of in, indigenous European or or British mythology and and Christian mythology, like really either fairies are real or Christianity is real. But here it's all real. It's fine. It's like, we're just gonna mash that up. I, like these these yeah these pagan basically. Um, deities or, or pagan figures nymphs satyrs fawns are on the side of 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 god in this in this world it's very weird yeah and 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 uh, i i suspect actually because we, we don't normally get these this, this level of sort of christian figure in this kind of thing you know they're really laying it on that 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 uh, every so often it sort of really come comes to the fore um and possibly problematically in the next act we'll see um uh but yeah it's it's interesting um uh, i uh, eric i did see a hand earlier but i'll go to helen first then i'll come back to you yeah, i have absolutely no idea where this is going but so far it does seem to be yeah. a bit of a clown vehicle mm. Mm. he gets all the best lines and situations um i mean the other people have lines the other people have activities but they are they are the backdrop against which you get the clown mm. um yeah yes uh the clown is very dominant so far um uh you know uh, but then so we say so far there hasn't actually been that much you know we're at the end of act two but actually this is a very short play uh eric then aliki then francis I was going to say that because like we were talk I think it was last week that Lynn mentioned um, or I don't know time is weird anyway um, that Lynn mentioned how tragedy was more of a format thing rather than a content thing. So I was thinking maybe that this is because it says tragical history of. Uh, so I was like, well, it's not tragical at the moment, but it seems to be sort of like um, it feels a bit like the beginning of Solomon and Persida. Pers where you've got that thing of, Bas I think it was Basilisco, I can't remember his name, who is kind of uh, being preyed upon by this kid, um, just sort of kicked off. And then suddenly, well, I, I didn't get to see, I mean, I didn't get to see the end because my internet died. But then um, <laughs> it was just kind of like, how is this a tragedy again? And then suddenly in act, I don't know, in, in the second half, it kind of took this big dive into darkness of like you know Solomon killing off people and sort of you know, it just became a very weird play yes that that's a play one of our select few plays where they kill the clown uh quite explicitly on stage so um doesn't happen very often maybe it will take that turn I don't know uh so far I mean it could also be that the printer just didn't read it properly um you know that's not entirely unknown uh but you know uh, but yeah that question about genres re re a really good one uh, a leaky Francis then Sarah and then we'll move on 
I'm really curious about the staging of the fairies, particularly their size. They're clearly described as being tiny. And I wonder if they were played by small children or if there was some other, to me, youthful Oberon suggests maybe they were played by small children. They don't have that many lines, do they? Mm. Um, but yeah, just because that's, that's certainly not always the case. Mm. That sometimes fairies appear to be human sized. This is not one of these occasions. Uh, Francis. Yeah, I was um, a bit confused um, uh, at the end of that scene because Oberon says uh, the Black Enchanter, he's gone to hell. But it was a bit unclear in terms of staging how that was achieved. Did a guy do it by touching the wand to the tower or did fairies do it? You know, what happened there? I think that's partly because of where we paused mid scene. Uh, right. I think the enchanter does stuff to Guy, and then Oberon immediately says, "I will break thy charming sorceries." Um, so I wonder whether there's a he sort of semi banishes the the the, the enchanter um, as an overlapping bit of yeah. business. Yeah, but that's I'm not the, sure yeah. about that. I'm just yeah. uh, that's just occurring to me. Um, well, yeah, but that's still Deus Ex Machina or Fairy Ex Machina. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. But, you know, the Enchanter came out of nowhere. I see no reason why it can't be banished back to nowhere for no readily apparent reason. I think that's probably fine. Um, you know, but he gets a magic wand, so, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's a good thing to have. Yeah. Yeah, every every home should have one. Uh, the, the, the recharge time, however, is a nightmare. Mm. Um, anyway, uh, Sarah. Um, yeah, uh, I forgot what I was going to say now. Oh, yeah, just, <laughs> just picking up on what Eric said. Um, yeah, um, again, there's, there's another parallel with uh, Thomas Cromwell. Um, the, because that does very much start out as a comedy. Um, and then take, takes a dark turn. And it's interesting because at the point at where it takes a dark turn, the clown disappears. Mm. Um, you know, Hodge is so dominant through the first half. And then he suddenly, he, he, he does, he crops up back in London momentarily when Cromwell gets back there and then he disappears and you never see him again because the tone of the play shifts dramatically. And I'm just wondering if we're going to um, get the same thing here. Oh, and the other, because I'm now I'm now on like a, a whole like Hodge comparison obsession. But um, he's a great he's a great one, Sparrow, isn't he, for describing what's happened to him. <laughs> he really likes to you know spin his narrative tale um, to his master, and that is giving me strong flashbacks as well. Yeah, are we going to have late onset disappearing clown disorder or not? Yeah. We shall see uh, as we go into Act 3 and with the inevitability of a ticking clock. Enter time. Thus swiftly runs the silent hours of time whilst worldly men, secured by their wealth, think not on time nor on their souls for health. But those whose well-adorned limbs are made of that pure metal which shall never fade. Those that have learned of angels how to sing, and to the world all piety doth bring, and fills the world with learning and with art. And to those doth time her golden gifts impart. You fair beholders of this honoured story, think now that Guy of Warwick he is gone, leaving those fairies and King Oberon, and now to fair Jerusalem takes his way. We're hearing of the wars the pagans make against that city and that holy land. He now prepares himself. <coughs> Sorry. He now prepares himself by force of arms to save Judea from ensuing harms. Long stories are not told in little time. Much matter in small room we must combine. We'll curt all nothing, yet make something short because we would sun shun tediousness of sport if it be long say length is all the fault if it be lame say old men needs must halt and we can infer the exit of time and let's see whether we go down a problematic alley or not act three scene two enters sultan uh shamurath a uh, sultan of babylon uh, with zarestes 
Thus, Sultan Shamrath, as earthly god of kings, have marched along with all their warlike troops. Ten thousand galleys, ships, and brigadines lie dancing on the Adriatic Sea, ready to be commanded when we please, to bear this captive king of fair Jerusalem to our triumphant city Babylon. But say, Zorastes, how shall we employ our warlike forces against these Christians? Most dread and mighty emperor of the East, whose puissant and warlike force commands, even from the Orient to the sun's decline, suffer not thus these hated Christians to immure themselves in walls of stone and brass, whilst Sultan Samarath, with all his lords, sent, attends a day of battle with their swords. Great king of Babel, now be ruled by me, and let Sarastis' counsel now prevail. I'll raise up heaps of damned spirits from hell that shall make way unto my bold attempt. Legions of devils attend my dreadful charms, ready to be commanded when I please. Then, mighty Sardan, make no more delay. My art shall make the conqueror this day. Thanks, stout Zorastes, great magician, thanks. But first, let's summon them unto a parley. Perhaps they'll yield their city unto our hands, knowing our force to be invincible, and they not able to withstand our power. Trumpet or drum, summon a parley there. It's lovely to get a choice. Um, uh, I, I'm choosing neither. I'm just going to say a parley has sounded somehow. Enter the King of Jerusalem upon the walls. What craves the Syrian emperor at our hands? Homage and fealty is thy sovereign lord. Of, these, of all these spacious bounds of Christendom, no petty king of fair Jerusalem. I am the mighty Sultan Shamarath that rules the triple city Babylon and all the kingdoms of the Eastern world. Only this little part of Asia holds out against us and derides our faith, scorning our laws of holy Muhammad. But by his blessed Alcaron, I swear, I'll ne'er impart nor draw my army hence till in the temples of Jerusalem both Mahomet, Astaroth, and Termagant, those holy gods that governs Babylon, be set for you, stout Christians, to adore, which ye shall do, or all of you shall die, and basely at her foot like vassals lie. Proud and presumptuous tyrant as thou art, we fear no bugbear threats of tyranny, nor all the multitudes thou canst command. We guard and keep the blessed sepulchre of our dear Savior and Redeemer Christ within the walls of fair Jerusalem. Though on a sudden with your heathen troops, you have begirt us with a fearful siege. Yet now, yet no proud Syrian that fair Zion's hill, King Solomon's temple and the marble tomb, which we adore with awful reverence, can raise a hundred thousand Christians and proudly beat you back to Babylon. Thou wilt not then surrender us thy town? Not whilst one man survives to lift a sword. Attempt the worst you can to save or kill. We are prepared even against the worst of ill. And exit the king of Jerusalem. Why then at all march forward, warlike lords. We'll parley now with Polax, bills and swords. Derain our battles and begin the fight. And Mahound still direct my course aright. I'm sorry, but I do seem to have accidentally got a few pages of Tamblaine the Greats um, uh, uh, mixed in here. Um, I, I'm terribly sorry. I don't know how that happened. Um, it, it, it's, yeah, it, um, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Plus one line from Dew of Malta. Yeah, it's it's an interesting little um, uh, mishmash. Uh, Alan. The whole thing is beginning to feel to me like yet another one of these best bits. Compilation yeah, I, 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 numbers, I, I, you know. I, I don't buy the best bits uh, argument for most of these, though. Um, you know, it, it, you're absolutely, I think we're absolutely right. The clown is being given a lot of steam. Um, but, um, you know, there is a narrative they're trying to tell that's just a very loose one. Just enough plot to, to hold the thing together. I mean, it's 
standard musical scripting arrangements. Uh, Bryony... You know, you don't want too much plot. Yeah, Bryony, then Rachel. It is really, really random, but I don't know. I, this this mythology mashup gives it a real cohesion for me. Like because you've got we've got even more thrown in now, and then going back to something because Stephen had put something in the chat about uh, Colbran. I had a little look into that, and Colbran was a giant in English mythology. Um, another giant and so again it gives another layer to that because it's extra insulting then to be misnaming Oberon as Colbran if he's played by this tiny little boy and things it's just I, I'm just loving the, the complete mashup of different mythologies I'll go to Stephen next um yeah well just just speaking to those last two points really the um this, the book the, the standard work on the Queen's Men refers to them having a medley style but <laughs> I, I think actually what we're talking about is jukebox here in the sense that, you know, you have a jukebox musical, you have something that you know and something else you know. And I, I think that's what both um, Bryony and Alan are saying in a sense. It's like something familiar, not not necessarily, uh, you know, absolutely in terms of pinching lines from somewhere, but it's kind of like, OK, and here, you know, here's, we've just had the ballad and now we're getting you know, the rock and roll number or something like that. And, uh, it, you know, unless you really are fixated on on the plot, which, you know, who goes to musicals for the plot? This is kind of like musicals, but without the music, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's just... well, yeah, it's, it's basically the plot is Guy does goes goes travelling. Um, <laughs> you know, first, first act sets that up. Second act is him encountering a hermit and an enchanter. And third act is is the long awaited uh, call to actually get to Jerusalem. Um, so, yeah, and so in that sense, you know, establishing these uh, these these characters because uh, presumably Guy is going to interact with them. Uh, you know, probably not for very long, but we shall see. Uh, Rachel, uh, eight, uh, ages ago, and Leaky. Um, no, I was going to say uh, it does seem a little bit like a, a sketch show like a comedy sketch show or like not a comedy sketch show but uh just uh why do i not uh, never mind uh monty python monty python where there's like a cohesive story in the movies but it, it's it's all joke on joke for jokes and then uh just that you know, Zorro asked uh, uh, Astes and uh, the Sultan. It's such a, it was so great the way Stephen and Eric did it because Stephen w was so, was so doing that. And then Eric was like, thanks, sir, Astes, great magician, thanks. It would be just such a great uh, moment for that seriousness to hit and then just be like, oh, thanks. Yeah, cool. That's so nice. Mm. It's also structurally interesting, you know, the the structurally interesting in in relation to say something like Dr. Faustus, in the sense that you have these these long, uh, this sequence of scenes uh, in the middle, which is you know journeying, journeying. Some stuff can happen, some stuff can happen, because you know, and it's all strung along because it's happening to Guy, who's some guy, um, uh, a leaky. Then we'll move on because we have a few scenes in relatively quick succession to look at. Uh, just noting that although. We have some idea of what um, what Muslim names sound like and whereabouts you might expect to find Muslims. We have no idea what they believe because apparently they have three gods who are called Muhammad, Astaroth, and Termagant. And just lovely. <laughs> yeah, and I, I uh, all all during the reign of King Athelstan. Uh, really? So um, you know. <laughs> I mean, I. I'm not sure what termagant is. I've only heard it applied to a small, angry woman. <laughs> but there must be a, a mythological thing. I know what Astaroth is. and We've met uh, Astaroth more than once. It. Yeah. <laughs> uh, could almost get his own chat show um, at the rate we're going. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to move us on, though. Hold on to any thoughts you may uh, have had. Um, as we try and uh, engage with the rest of Act 3 uh, in this location. Let's see if it gets uh, any more problematic. Um, no it, it, no insult is, is intended to any major world religions, by the way. This is just the text. Uh, Act 3, Scene 3, Enter Guy of Warwick Alone. Thus, through the help of my dear Saviour Christ, 
whose outstretched arm hath still preserved me, I am escaped from Sultan Shamurath and all his host of cursed Saracens. Now I am come where I may fix mine eyes safely upon King David's city walls. Is this Judea's prize, fair Zion's hill, sanctum sanctorum and the house of heaven, the place where my dear saviour lost his life? Oh, how it grieves me to behold thy walls, hemmed in with dogs and cursed Saracens that seek to rob thee of thy beauty quite and turn thy joyful, joyful day to morning night. But heaven assisting me, I will prevent their damned purposes and make them repent their journey taken against Judea's good, or in that fair adventure spend my blood. Enter Sparrow, crying. <laughs> tarry, tarry, tarry. Hold, hold, hold. Why, how now, sirrah? What's the news with you? Oh, master, are you there? I have done such an exploit as you never heard of in your life. <laughs> What's that, sir? Nay, I am sure it passes your capacity, but I'll tell you, though, for it was a valiant piece of service. When I saw you got in amongst the Polgons, I thought some, but somebody had hired you to break heads by the dozen, for you never hit any of them. But they shake their heels as though they had the palsy. I, seeing you so hard at work, thought I not best to trouble you. But after the old manor ran and hid myself in a bush. Oh, cowardly slave, was this your valiant piece of service? Oh, master, you not you do not hear half yet. I lay so long till you were gone, and looking out of the bush, I could see all the pogons laid fast asleep. Then, when I sneak in and stole away their snapsacks with all their victuals, I got up to the top of the hill and I eat it up every bit. When I had done, I began to hollow. The pogons, missing their provant, came running after me. I, but I made one pair of legs worth two pair of hands, and out of them, and outrun them all, if faith. I thought what hurts hot service you do always. But peace, here comes the king of fair Jerusalem. Enter the king of Jerusalem. I am a wretched king, the more my woe. Kings are sometimes distressed, and I am so. But if thou be that warlike conqueror, that through the pagan host hath cut thy way, I do beseech thee even with woeful tears to save Judea, Sion, Palestine, from base attempt of heathen servitude. If it be... Oh, scurvy if it be. Why, I'll tell you, goodman king, twas I and my master tickled him, if faith. True, sir, you and your master and I. Pray, what did you? Why, master, when you had killed them, I came and cut off their heads. Where wert thou born? Uh, or what's thy country's name? Brave Christian knight, may I be so bold to ask? My native country is fair England called. My name, Sir Guy of Warwick, hither come of holy zeal to see my saviour's tomb. But seeing it hemmed round about with foes, I cut a passage with my warlike sword, meaning to rescue it or lose my life. Heaven prosper thy attempt. Lead on, fair knight. God and good angels still protect our right. God and St. George in Warwick's quarrel fight. And they exit. Um, I'm just getting real vibes from this scene of Guy comes out and he's doing his soliloquy and then the comic comes in. <laughs> sake. Um, I'm doing my speech. Let's get, <laughs> oh, okay, 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 yeah, sure. I will feed you the feed lines for your jokes. Thank you. Oh, good. The King of Jerusalem's come on. Uh, oh, no. Oh, shut up. <laughs> and, and then it's, it's like they, 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 they find, they try and get back into the play. It, 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 it's feeling that way. For the, I don't know if that's just us land, laying that on top. I'm just loving Francis just going, I'm supposed to be the title character, guys. <laughs> Francis. Yeah. 
Guy, you know, Guy, so Guy, Guy of Warwick, he, you know, he's supposed to be this heroic character, do, you know, with all this daring do, but he's very passive in this. It's mm -hmm. just, yeah, it, it's a strange play in that regard. Yeah, and it's, his opening lines are a bit weird. It makes you wonder whether um, we've missed something because he goes, I'm escaped from Sultan. Yeah. So, so I'm sort of going, yeah. was there a, was there a, were you captured and you escaped? What 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 happened there? Or yeah. you know, very odd. Maybe there's something missing. Who knows? Um, uh, any other thoughts before we move on? We've got a couple of scenes left to do. Uh, Lynn, then Eric, and then we'll move on. I was just going to say really quick. Um, Sparrow crying is obviously Sparrow crying as in yelling rather than crying as in weeping. Mm. I think that's what that must mean. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's right. It's not it's not the crying that we had earlier, um, uh, though. Uh, yeah, so um, shouty shoutiness, but um... but we got some great comedy crying there. So <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, it, you made it work. I mean that 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 was that was fine. Um, but yeah, that's um, we can I, I we can direct that properly for next time, <laughs> uh, Eric. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that it looks like maybe because we were talking about how, when was he captured, it looks like the next start of the next scene might actually be um, sort of the scene that um, is the confrontation. I don't know. Well, we'll 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 see. We'll, we'll find um, out in a minute, we'll, I guess. We'll see. <laughs> um, it seems like they're going to go into a fight, and that's what's coming next. So. Um... Maybe I don't recall time filling us in. Did time mention anything like him actually encountering them yet? I don't think. No, there was anything. no, he didn't. No. He, time just said, you know, he's gone to Jerusalem. You know, he's he's left Oberon and the fairies, and he's gone to Jerusalem to save Christ too. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, we go into Act Three, Scene Four. <laughs> Alarum enter Sultan Zarestes from the fight. Fighting has occurred. Oh, speak, Zarestes. What devil or man is that which in his fury confounds such heaps of men? My lord, I cannot tell. But this I know. Neither Turk nor Saracen can withstand his blow. Our soldiers fly like chaff before the wind, and none can stand against his conquering sword. Canst thou not tell me what he is, and nor by thy magic charms confound the slave? I can do both, as you shall straight behold. Belemoth, Astaroth, ascend! Red Marius. I charge thee, tell me truly who it is that in his rage confounds and spoils our men. Tis Guy of Warwick that is hither come of holy zeal to see his saviour tomb. But never shall he see that marble grave. Go, Bellamoth, and in a fierce frame hoist him aloft into the vacant air and throw him headlong in the neighbouring seas. Ah, We fight, my lord, for victory is yours. Why? Then Zorassis once more to the fight, and Mahomet direct my course aright. And they exit. Act 3, scene 5. Alarum excursions. <laughs> Enter Sultan and Zorastes flying. I don't think literally. I think running. Uh, Guy and, their, uh, and they fight. So there's a bit of a fight with Guy. Uh, Zorastes escapeth. Guy taketh the Sultan prisoner. Then enter the King of Jerusalem. Command these brawling drums to cease their noise, whilst I salute our warlike conqueror, renowned Sir Guy of Warwick, whose great name extols fair England with a glorious fame. Sit in our throne, victorious Englishman. Our crown and scepter, our crown and scepter shall be all as free to Guy of Warwick as it is to me. Far be it from the thought of Englishmen to usurp the seat of fair Jerusalem. But for those favours you have graced me with, here I resign unto your princely hands, great Sultan Shamarath, King of Babylon. 
victorious knight, both in thy words and deeds, this proud presumptuous king of Babylon, which thou surrenderest here as prisoner, I freely do deliver back to thee to ransom or dispose as thou thinkst best. Let me be ransomed, mighty Christian knight, and I will back surrender to thy hands all these towns and castles I have won. Joppa, Samaria, and rich Nazareth with 50,000 bars of silver plate to ransom home great Sultan Shaburah. I scorn thy league and love, proud heathen king. I'll make thee now my vassal's underling. Scornst thou to love the monarch of the world? The monarch of black hell should I not scorn, the love of Beelzebub, Leviathan. Sultan Stamps. Nazar, I'll make you tear your Muhammad and stamp and stare. Enter Sparrow with... I will read this stage direction as writ, with a pagan in a halter. Ay, and swear to it, faith, afore I have done with him. Oh, master, you think I can do nothing. I have catched a pogon. How, sir, I pray? Why, master, after the valiantest manner that could be, for I found him asleep, and having a halter in my pocket, put it about his neck instead of falling, instead of a falling band. But what will you do with him now? Marry, master, first and come foremost. I'll hang him by two hours by the clock. Then I'll cut off his head, because he shall not call me a knave for my labour, and when I have done so, I'll let him go his way. Nay, ye horse and pogon, I'll tickle ye, that's flat. The pogon, hmm, pagan, takes the halter from his own neck and puts it about Sparrow's neck and runs away. Oh, master, the pogon has given me two slips for a tester, but I'll after him. If I catch him again, I'll give him a cord east in his chaps. That's two turns and a wry mouth, and then he may drink to his friend all the day after. Exit Sparrow, the rest of the cast just check to make sure he's definitely off and continue the dialogue. Since that your majesty hath back delivered this Sultan Shamarath into my hands, know the ransom I will set on him, shall please our God and all good Christians. O blessed emperor, think upon the cross, which is the true badge of our sweet saviour Christ, by whose great help we have got victory, then to enlarge the fame of Christendom and our great maker's ever glorious name, thou, Sultan Shamarath, with all thy host, shall leave your faith and become Christians. Do this, from any ransom thou art free, and all thy people set at liberty. We yield consent, victorious conqueror. The God you serve is great, omnipotent, ruling the day of battle as he please, making 100 kill 10,000 men. Such were the odds of our battalions. Therefore, for a guy of Warwick's sake, we trust in Christ and Mahound clean forsake. Then fit we honored to the marble tomb, where you shall have received your Christendom. You and your lord shall take a solemn oath, that all your empery shall do the like. Come on, brave guy, for by thy hand is done this everlasting fame to Christendom. Exuant king and sultan leaving guy alone on stage. Go on, great kings. I'll follow presently. And now, since all those wars are at an end, and that my heavenly maker hath vouchsafed to give me victory against his foes, in lowly pilgrimage I vow to come and visit my dear Saviour's blessed tomb. There, for an everlasting memory, I'll offer up my sword and furniture. And here I make a vow in sight of heaven that henceforth I'll never bear arms again, but spend the residue of my sinful life in zealous prayers and repentant tears for all the follies of my wretchless youth now, glorious God, with thy auspicious eye, smile on this happy work that's thus began to enlarge the fame of blessed Christendom. And exit Guy. So he's going to offer up sword furniture. He's never going to bear arms again. What about Phyllis? So I just thought I'd bring up Phyllis there. Um, uh, you know, I'm getting the impression that we read the first scene with him and Phyllis all wrong. 
Um, <laughs> that him and Sparrow are much more similar than we thought. Um, okay, there were some problematic moments in that, but also quite amusing moments. Um, yeah, it's just, yeah. Um, we get a spirit. Um, we get, um, yeah. I was talking about, you know, we've met Astaroth a few times. Um, it's not quite clear whether this is Astaroth or, uh, or Belmoth or whether Belmoth is a way of describing Astaroth. Um, they do, it does say Belmoth, but um, yeah. Um, anyway, same sort of idea. Uh, yeah, thoughts from the room. Who wants to leap in? Francis. Yeah, um, there's a question. What was this furniture that Guy was referring to? Sorry, it made me laugh, I imagine, to 3 be sweet or something. Uh, Lynn, do you want to leap in on it, that? Yeah, it just means like accessories. Furniture, what what we call furniture was called movables uh, in, in the period. So for, furniture means, and other stuff, like the stuff that goes, accessories is probably the closest word we have. Yeah, right. beard, beard, okay. beard trimming set, uh, comb, <laughs> you know. No, 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 no. Helmet, brush. shield. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Armour. Yeah. Yeah, all yeah. oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Furnishings. Yeah. Like the stuff that you're furnished with, so. Uh, yes, uh, other thoughts. Um <laughs> Yeah, well, and I, the, the, but you know this this uh, this this section seems to have effectively closed itself off. We've had this little interlude here. That last scene, the elements of this again, I, I mentioned Doctor Faustus earlier, but you know the whole th throwing chicken wings at the Pope sequence. You know, there's a certain element of that here, um, of you know the, the 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 this is all very, and I made the joke earlier about everyone making sure that Sparrow has exited, but it does seem like Sparrow is. It's not that we've got, here are some funny scenes here. It does seem like Sparrow is designed to interrupt the action in, in a really quite intrusive way, um, which is making that dynamic really interesting. Everyone's trying to be noble and Sparrow won't let them. <laughs> uh, which is a really redeeming feature, actually, I'm finding, for, you know, for the little bits where we're going, mm, this is a bit of... But if he, Sparrow turns up and basically says, this is all nonsense... That's a really nice get out that um, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I can be played with. Yeah. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, another a, another sort of dating thing. I'm thinking back to like, I've never heard the word pregnant to mean what we mean pregnant to mean. And the, um, if I am not mistaken, if I remember correctly, Sparrow's reference to a falling band is a type of collar that's from the, the Caroline or late Jacobean period. You, uh, uh, the normal neck wear would have been a ruff in the 1590s. Uh, so a falling band is that, you know, when you think of a cavalier, that's, that's that style of collar. So at, at least that little piece of text is from, is from later. It's from after 1600. Uh, any any uh, additional thoughts on that sort of area or just other things in the last two scenes that we looked at, Aliki? Spirit, yeah. spirit, speak. <laughs> Just that here again, we have the comedy version of the serious thing brought up by Sparrow. I have a noble prisoner. Let us discuss how he will be disposed and what his ransom is and what he must do. I've got a prisoner here. Oops, he's run away. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Um, and yeah, the, the, this play is playing around with magic-y things and, and having fun with playing with magic-y things and just putting the, you know, we've had fairies in the last one. Uh, now we've got uh, we've got spirits being conjured, um, which, you know, there are no stage directions for any of those um, uh, for this bit. It was last act, but there's no stage direction for this spirit. But uh, we can infer that perhaps there's uh, something moderately elaborate for that. Uh, so spectacle is being suggested francis yeah well, <clears throat> what always strikes me about these um these plays involving uh ancient muslims is um, how, you know the way they're portrayed as being uh willing to give up the to abandon their faith so quickly and it's just i, I just think these days that's um it, it will be very difficult to present that these days yeah, that's that. that. Yeah, portray that. 
it, it, it's so cursory as well. It's not yeah. like there is any, you know, it's just going, hey, maybe you should convert. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not, not, not just that, but that, well, the, you know, in the, the previous scene, portraying them as polytheistic, which <laughs> they are quite explicitly not. Mm -hmm. And here, um, the Sultan's saying, oh, you know, your God has proved to be omnipotent. It's the same God. It's the God of Abraham. And the fact that this text doesn't seem to know that it's, it's a little, it's troubling. It's yeah. So the, the portrayal of Islam in this text, it would be really problematic if you were going to try to produce a version of it these days. Mm. Uh, Rachel. Uh, no, on, on speaking to that sort of same thing, uh, I wrote in the chat, um, and Aliki, I wrote in the chat, you know, uh, you know, the King of Jerusalem being Christian and, you know, uh, Aliki replied that very, very briefly, like it was Christian, like Christianity in Jerusalem, but just the, it, both, uh, Islam and uh, Judaism, you know, which are very prominent religions in that region are, are misconstrued and, you know, very much erased that they're monotheistic and that they're, you know, just the misportrayal of that. Yeah, it's just one of those, uh, I, I don't know, weird notes that you hit in these, um, when, when they bring this up. Hmm. Well, it's it's you know there there are plays that get it wrong and there are plays that don't care, um, and and this is a play that doesn't really seem to care. I mean, it doesn't really have any conception of actual history, um, in any of its. You know, we can try and unpack any element of this and just going. Well, when is this happening? Because it seems to be happening in so many different times at the same time uh, and addressing so many different things. So um, it, it, it's doing all sorts of very strange games. Uh, I mean, uh, Helen mentioned in the chat also Fry Bacon and Fry Bungie, which we haven't mentioned, or uh, John of Bordeaux uh, as well. You know, things are involving magic, um, playing around with magic and, and getting things wrong because the author doesn't seem to care um, because that's not what's, what's going on. Um, so, yeah. Uh, we are approaching final thoughts. Does anyone have anything else for Act 3 before I go around the room for any final <laughs> thoughts uh, for the play so far? Uh, Francis. Yeah, just some, one thing that occurred to me, um, going back to the furniture that um, uh, the guy offers up with his sword, um, is that going to, going to include the ring that Phyllis uh, gave him? That you know, we haven't heard anything more about this ring that was rather pointedly um, uh, given in the first scene. I think it was. Mm. Yeah, no, it's a really good point because he just suddenly, out of the blue, says, "You know what? I think I'm just gonna just, just, um, just, uh, just uh, do some, some praying stuff." Um, mm. And and everything, everything about his, you know, follies of my wretchless youth. Maybe, maybe. He's, you know, it's 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 not looking good for on the Phyllis side of things no. at all, um, no. which I suppose is perhaps a way to uh, open it out for the final thoughts of the session so far. Mm. Bryony, uh, it'd be fair to say you've you've had fun today. Uh, mm. Any final thoughts about the play so far? Um, just yeah, not not anything that we haven't really touched on in the discussion, but just the way that they've used this comic character of Sparrow that I was lucky enough to play and share a name with in real life um is is brilliant like yeah like just completely derailing everything um with a bit of silliness and then jumping into a bush great yeah um let's hope there were no stinging metals uh Stephen, do you have any final thoughts by the way if people don't have any final thoughts be feel free to 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 uh, hold your counsel move on for another time uh Stephen. I'm I'm really interested to see where it's going to go because it, it, we've had some quite you know sort of full length serious sort of geopolitical plays, haven't we? And this is this is quite a a, a, a bold move in a sense because we have you know we we insert sort of some very very English sort of elements to it. Uh, it reminded me a little bit of the famous victories where you you have the sort of clowns following uh, onto the battlefield. Um, but my recollection is that we don't get this kind of thing happening in those those big sort of you know epoch shaking confrontations in some of the sort of Mediterranean 
Turk plays we've seen. Um, so I think it's you know you, you you could make an you know you could either say well this is just a sort of cynical kind of you know throwing together any old rubbish or you can think of it as trying to do something new with a genre of plays that is popular um, and has held the stage and and so you know you could you could argue for for Sparrow's role as being you know an artistic experiment. I'm interested to see where it's going to go, seeing as we've now apparently abandoned all of that. Mm. Uh, Aliki, <coughs> any final thoughts? Uh, just, I really love Sparrow. I don't always love the clowns. Uh, maybe it's in part Bryony's interpretation of him, but I just, I'm having such a good time. I haven't laughed so hard in one of the plays in a long time. Yeah, there isn't painful clown set-up joke situations here it's just very very well put together wordplay um and it has impact and energy and that makes such a difference uh, alan any final thoughts it still feels to me like a bit of a gallimore free of best bits from wherever i i think it is very much a clown vehicle with just enough uh plot and other stuff pulled it pulled in to hold it in vaguely together and i think also from what we've seen two or three times particularly in stage directions that there was an opportunity for quite a lot of spectacle um and that would depend on what the availability was of the ability to do effects in whatever environment the thing was being performed in at the time. Uh, Rachel, <clears throat> any final thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I, I liked uh, I liked a lot of people's interpretation of the characters. Uh, Helen and, and Briny's scene going back and forth, I really liked. Uh, Zoroastes and um, the Sultan going back and forth. I really liked uh and you know what you said about the humor how it's it's easy to understand it's not like some other plays where we have to stop and and discuss what what do they mean by these jokes they've translated and and transitioned very well um to still be understood I, you know just as they are it's more like situational humor as opposed to um you know these these this tight linguistical humor where it's like a, a tennis match or a badminton thing um mm. yeah it yeah I and mean, it really helps that you know uh, that sparrow is uh, a, a, of mostly mocking the situation that is already happening around him so it's not like the, the 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 back and forth we have in some of the Lily plays, where you have an entirely separate scene where some servants come on and do some business. Uh, this is actually integrated and commenting on the on the primary action, which is really really nice. Um, talking about the primary action, Francis, um, I'm seeing guy at the moment as Kenneth Horn, um, the straight guy, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and and every so often Kenneth Williams comes on and uh, and 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 starts up staging him, and he just does everything very deadpan. <laughs> Um, yes. that's, that's sort of that's sort of my thinking at the moment with this play. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know if you agree or disagree or have other thoughts of your own. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Any bold? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so for those at home, we're doing references to a 1960s radio series called Around the Horn. Uh, look it out; it's quite fun. Yeah, um, yeah, it is <laughs> very saucy. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Beyond what people have been saying about it being be, it being this strange mishmash of of uh, characters, um, I find the the uh, the juxtaposition of all this you know all these heroic deeds and these heroic events with the com I, I find the juxtaposition with the comedy a bit strange. Um, but uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not sure whether we're supposed to take guys seriously or not. Um, but that said, I I I found the comedy scenes a lot more enjoyable to play, as you could probably tell. Um, um, but like Stephen, I'm really interested to see where all this goes. 
Yeah, because I wonder whether there's something meta that could be done with this. You know, that guy's in this very <clears throat> serious play, or you know, he's this sort of desperate. This is the last chance for career for uh, with the actor playing guy, and they've dug out this play, and they've they've also unfortunately hired a stand up comic to do some other stuff, and it's like it all went horribly, horribly wrong. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it it has that quality though. Again, we could be projecting, but that's a routine actually, I, I, which may get over yeah. some of the hurdles of the text, uh, where uh, trims and cuttings don't quite fully cut it, uh, as it were. Sarah, any final thoughts? King Athelstan, who um, I thought that sounded ter terribly impressive when I gave you that part, and then I, I realised that you buggered off and were never seen again. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. I've, I've, it doesn't matter because I've just so enjoyed uh, listening to and reading it and listening to everyone else. Um, I have three final thoughts. Um, my first one, you've pretty much just said. Um, I think that is absolutely like playing up the anarchy and finding a sort of meta way into this is absolutely the way to do it because there are... There are problems in this play. You know, Lynn did a really good job of, of, of pointing them up. Um, and I don't think, you know, they can be ignored. But on the other hand, I really want to find a way to stage this. And and the reason being is that, I, I mean, Sparrow is brilliant. Uh, like Aliki, I don't always like the clowns. Um, but I like clowns when they serve a particular function. And he's serving a very good function here that, you know, you and others have already talked about. Um but it's not just him. I just think all these characters. Guy is, you could play him in an absolutely hilarious way, you know, for, further to what you've just been saying, Rob. But all the kings, um, Parnell. I mean, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a dud part in this. And I just think this would be such a joy for a bunch of actors to get on stage with because it's just so hilarious so far. I mean, maybe we'll get tragedy tomorrow, but um, comedy tonight. And uh, it's it's just it, there's so much potential in it um, for for just comic business, and not just from the clown, but from everyone. Um, that takes me to my next point, which is Phyllis, who bless her, out of everybody, um, probably has has the least to do. But I, it did suddenly occur to me, like be, as we started to go through this play, and it got more and more anarchic. I thought, I wonder if there's actually scope for rethinking that first scene. And, you know, there's this very tender love scene between them. And then Guy goes off at the end, oh yes, I'm off now to be noble. And she's like, oh yes, goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. And then you could have like a sort of silent bit after he's gone at the scene ends where she's just like, oh, thank God. <laughs> and, she <laughs> and she just kind of, you know, rolls up her sleeves, has a bit of a stretch, has a bit of a scratch. And, you know, kind of, we have some sort of, you know, non-spoken inference where where she's just clearly so relieved that he's gone because his his nobling is just like winding her up something proper and she's just really relieved to be rid of him. Um, so that was my second point. And my third point is just we haven't had a t-shirt line for a while and um, they have tickled my colophodiums. I just think that's one to put in the, in the list. So, yeah. Put it in the chat. Put it in the chat. <laughs> Okay. Uh, type that in, please. Uh, I can't remember where that was. Uh, anyway, uh, 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 send the reference. Yes, um, I, I'm also really interested in the doubling potential of who's playing whom as well. I mean, I think what you know, maybe the reason why the the uh, it's partly structural, but you know that Phyllis and uh, uh, etc. are doubling as 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 fairies and doubling as as you know. So there might be an interesting question about who's playing what, and in a modern production how you double this could be really fun, especially as it's episodic. So basically everyone who's in Act 3 is double, doubled as someone who was earlier and, 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 and round, and it's, it's, it's sort of uh, the, the way that people could turn round could be quite extreme, and that could add to the chaos. Anyway, we've talked a lot on that. Uh, Lynn, any final thoughts? Yeah, I just want to also say I am very curious about what happens next, uh, like... Um, Francis and, and Stephen, because we have this sort of false ending where, mm. oh, I've, you know, returned Jerusalem to, you know, diffuse the threat to Jerusalem from the terrible Saracens. And now I'm going to retire from battle. And in fact, I'm going to leave all my armor and stuff here. So I don't even have the tools of that. So, but we still have two acts to go. So we're obviously setting up 
for something, I guess. Um, that would be my guess as a as an audience member is that um, this isn't the real end. This is a, this is a this is a false flag. So I'm super curious what the next adventure is going to be. Mm. Uh, Eric, any final thoughts? Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering, do you want them in this voice or like the other voice? Uh, no. Choose a voice. The other Choose voice. <laughs> Well then, uh, no, uh, um, suddenly we respect your opinions so much more. <laughs> yeah, so much more. Yes, indeed. Um, well, uh, I, I think I think this play is very in doing some very interesting things, uh, as we've said, and um, I, I'm curious to see where it goes next. I, I don't I, I don't know if we're gonna have like the sort of curse of the final session if it's just two sessions, but yeah. Yes, we only have one more session. Will the, will the curse of the final session strike? We shall find out. Helen, do you have any thoughts? Um, yeah, this has more than um, fulfilled my expectations. All I'd looked at was the cast list and thought, yeah, this is going to be a goodie. And it really, really is. It's, it's, it's a perfect play but I'm wondering how perfect a play would it be if we hadn't read all those other plays mm -hmm. because a lot of the joy of this is that we remember all the other plays not necessarily the plays that these particular actors have that we're watching in our mind's eye have been in but the um all, all, all the various threads now i'm wondering if that means that this play was written for an audience that really knew its plays mm. and that it knew all about the turk plays and the questing plays and had seen them all and mm. was ready for them be, to be sent up Yes, because, you know, we, we talked about Musidorus, we, which we've done twice. Uh, we've, uh, you know, talked about uh, Fry Bacon. We've talked about Faustus. Uh, Faustus we've looked at twice, um, as indeed has everybody. Um, and all the other references, uh, uh, Thomas Cromwell, which we've done twice. Um, so, yeah, uh, we can probably go to Bryony as our, uh, our, our, our one of our newer recruits to see whether you felt you you felt engaged uh, 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 or whether that, 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 that that's an issue. Yeah, I was just putting it in the chat, actually, because I'd, I'd had my final moment already. But yeah, I really enjoyed it. And I don't know a lot of these plays that you're referencing. Um, yeah, because I, I, my knowledge is very limited on these things. And I've, I've done a couple of bits and bobs with you. But yeah, I've, I've read Fausta separately. But most of the ones you just mentioned, I, I'm not familiar with. And I'm still really enjoying this. But I am familiar with a lot of mythology. And that's a big interest to me in any literature is is drawing on various mythologies from around the world so i don't know if that's part of it but i don't know I, i'm loving it i think yeah if if we're right about the mode that this play is looking at i think there's plenty of modern analogies in 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 terms of the tone and the way it's dealing with the material um, but it's a good point to to bear in mind actually that yeah maybe there's there is a closed uh, world uh, quality to uh, how we uh, we may read this text um i i've no i'm enjoying it enormously so far i'm i'm thinking that you know this play also is uh a, gives us scope for interjections uh into the text i mean literally i quite like the idea in act five a lawyer turns up and just uh, says okay stop there <laughs> and we'll just skip to next page um or, or little little moments like that when we do hit things where we just go this is not a good this no no not that bit and and just entirely highlight that yeah this play is doing some work that we do not want to do uh and should not be done so um but that said, the next session may deny that and say, shut that door in my face. Um, but I'm liking it as a possibility. So um, all that remains is to thank all these wonderful readers, uh, all their, their, their wonderful thoughts. Um, it has been it has been a really, really fun session. We haven't done a session for a little. Uh, it hasn't been exactly an enormous period of time, but uh, we haven't uh, we haven't really been uh, engaging in these things for a for a little bit so uh, uh, so uh, all that remains is to thank all the readers thank you very much everyone and goodbye Bye. I came away in a stinking complexity <laughs>